Cause her head glows like the sun Are the pop pirates here to stay? More questions in the Commons this afternoon. Broadcasting daily on 299 meters on the medium wave band, this is Radio City, your swinging tower of power. Remember, Big L is pocket size. Listen to Big Old Mighty Summertime Sunshine Sounds wherever you go. Well, this is Radio Caroline on 199 Meters, your all-day music station, Britain's first commercial radio station. My name's Tom Lodge, your disc jockey for the next hour. Life aboard the ocean and radio waves certainly has its attractions despite Postmaster Generals. It was a Postmaster General, Mr. Reginald Bevins, under the last Conservative government, who made the prediction that if the government didn't act against pop pirates, the coasts of Britain would soon be ringed by an armada of pop pirate ships. Well, there's the latest in the armada. It's just arrived, and it's got two radio stations aboard which will transmit for 24 hours. It's a former American Liberty boat, the Olga Patricia, which is to be renamed the Laissez-Faire, which roughly translated from the French means, leave us alone to make our money. At the moment, it looks as if the pop pirates will be left alone and are making money. It all started in April 1964 with Radio Caroline. Caroline now has two ships covering most of Britain between them. The pop pirates' next target, disused Akak forts in the Thames estuary. The biggest house is Radio 390, an artful purveyor of mood music rather than pop. Estimated audience, nearly two million. And Radio City, formerly owned by Screaming Lord Such, pumps out pop from shivering sands. A further million are claimed by Tiny Radio Essex, the first round-the-clock pirate station. In the Clyde estuary, Scotland's pop pioneer. Radio Scotland claims two and a half million listeners with strong local allegiance. And hoping to climb on the bandwagon soon, Yorkshire's Radio 270 and Tower Radio off the east coast, near Harwich, where the really big guns are. Led by Radio London, the biggest of the pirates, with a weekly audience of over 10 million. Nearby, the new challenger, the two-station pirate ship Radio England and Britain Radio. Over the whole of Great Britain, side by side with the BBC, there now exists a complete but illegal commercial radio service. Although governments have continually threatened all the pirates, starting with Caroline, no action has ever been taken. The ships broadcast just outside the three-mile territorial limit, so they come under no country's law. Even the pirates on the forts have been left untouched. Built in the war, the forts appear to belong to the Ministry of Defence, but the Ministry say it would be too dangerous to remove the pirates from them. Radio London. Radio London, self-styled, the mast with the most, is the Pirate King. For 17 and a half hours a day, it provides the top pops. Good afternoon. <laughs> Guys and gals, little ones and kittens, this is the Stu Part Show with Mike Lennox from now until 6 o'clock. We're going to have a good time. It's a rave-up afternoon. Watch out now for the number five sound from the big L fabulous Horty. This is Roy C. Here comes the bride of shotgun wedding. Most pirates now pay record royalties, but the whole economic success of pirate radio is based on the unlimited use of records. The BBC is rationed in its use by the so-called needle time agreement with the record companies, which restricts record time to protect musicians' jobs. London has pulled ahead of its rivals with non-stop pops in the fast and furious American style. It's currently billing £100,000 a month in ads. DJs on London get up to £50 a week. They have two weeks on ship, one on shore. Strong stomachs are needed to keep this down in the North Sea gales, which really rock the tall-masted radio ships. 
The pop pirate's world is a competitive one. Claims and counterclaims run riot. Yet finally you feel that they've come to form one big floating pressure group to push the government into setting up commercial radio on land. Philip Birch, managing director of Radio London, put the pirate's point of view this way. Uh, what we do know is that we have demonstrated that, again, our, our audience of 10 million people like to be able to tune into um, to, to popular music um, when it suits them. Um, as I say, possibly in the middle of the night, um, and not to be restricted by, in, in an artificial sense, by needle time. Um, on the other point to remember on this, of course, is that uh, it is not cheap to run a radio station at sea. It's a very expensive operation. Uh, keeping a, a, a ship of, of, of this size at sea, manned all the time with a crew of 30, um, is an expensive way to run a radio station. It would be much more economical to, to bring it ashore, as we hope the government will let us. But the prospects at sea are still tempting enough for swinging Radio England, the latest pirate recruit. Ambitiously, it plans to transmit two programmes, one pop, one mood music. It hopes to start this weekend, but formidable technical snags have so far limited it to tests alone. Testing now for Swinging Radio England, we're sending out a brand new test signal for a new sound. For the British Isles, give a listen to Swinging Radio England. Stay with the fun. Whoopee! Hear all the kids on Swinging Radio England. The fun spot. For pirates without ships, there are the forts in the Thames estuary. This houses Radio Essex, the smallest of all the pirates. Unoccupied and rusting since the end of the war, the forts were first exploited by screaming Lord Such. Others, like Roy Bates, the owner of Radio Essex, followed. In the early days here, the Thames estuary was rather like the Spanish main, with radio pirates capturing and losing forts regularly. Bates, an 8th Army veteran, calls it the land of the strong right arm. He should know. For single-handed, he boarded his fort and threw off some squatters from a rival radio station, who had previously thrown his men off. Bates still makes it difficult for anyone to get on, even though the swashbuckling days are over and the grey flannel suit has replaced the polo neck sweater. DJs on Radio Essex may not be highly experienced, but they certainly pull their weight. Bates paid nothing for the fort, he just took it. He says he couldn't have bought a place like it for a million pounds. The station itself cost him 45,000 pounds to set up. Oh, well, I'd like to remind you now that you're listening to Radio Essex at the time is 20 minutes before the hour of two o'clock, and at two o'clock we have the news for you. And uh, that will be read by David Sinclair. The news is every two hours on the hour. And right now we're going to hear from Dion Warwick. My own David Burt background composition this. I smiled yesterday. So I smiled yesterday. You know DJs here get from 12 to 25 pounds a week. But unlike the bigger pirates, do longer shifts and stay out for five weeks. Unlike the ships, the forts are high out of the water to send a good signal. Expenses on crew and ship are saved, and they're stable on the seabed. The fort armaments wouldn't be much use to the pirates if the Ministry of Defence did decide to repossess the forts. The guns fired their last shot in anger years ago. Essex plans to boost its signal soon to get into London. Though small, it's the first 24-hour pirate station and very popular with night shift workers. Bates claims his station is now running third in Essex to London and 390 and is optimistic about prospects. 
Do you think there is a vast, untapped advertiser's uh, revenue waiting? I mean, is there... Oh, yes. I mean, are, oh, yes. Are, have you got a license to print your own banknotes at a station <laughs> like uh, this? No, no, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as that. But uh, every day, every week, every month, more and more business people and more and more businesses are becoming educated to use commercial radio. And this is as it should be. What sort of increase could you see in the in the market? I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to foresee it, because I would like to see radio used for every form of advertising that there is used in every other media now, and this is the proper way to use it. Free air should be used uh, to advertise every commodity that is used in the free press. Why do you think the government have failed to act then? Well, I think they've left it too late to act now anyway. I think if they acted now, they would lose a tremendous amount of popularity. We're doing a job that's needed. The public wants us to do the job. So do, so do businesses. And I think while this demand is here, we'll remain in business. It's, do you fear government action against the pirate ships? Oh, no. Uh, the, 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 the kind of action that we think the government is likely to take is positive action. In other words, we feel now that the government recognizes that uh, there is a demand for the service that we're prov providing and that they're likely to arrange for the same sort of service to be provided on the land um, so that we don't anticipate uh, direct action against us but perhaps competitive action against us. The government could conceivably make it illegal to, um, to advertise on Radio London. Um, what would you do This then? would be difficult legislation as far as the government's concerned because most of Radio London's clients are large international companies and um, could quite easily place the advertising from Paris or New York. If the government wanted to close you up or wanted to seize you, I mean, what would you do then? Well, we don't think the government would seize us. Um, you see, the, the operation of uh, Radio London is legal in every way. It is quite legal to broadcast from the high seas. Um, in fact, the, the first illegal action would be just that, if, a, if the government decided to, to, to seize a ship that was at sea and behaving in a legal manner. Bill Vick from Texas is the managing director of American-backed Radio England. Does he fear that the government will act against the pop pirates? Well, of course, that's a fear that we learn to live with. Uh, in any business, would you, you do take a calculated risk. And uh, I feel like that uh, Mr. Wedgwood Ben has uh, said that he would pass legislation, and I feel like he'll certainly keep his word. But obviously, uh, not keep it uh, soon enough to stop you making money. Well, let, let's hope that he will uh, find other things that'll keep him busy enough to a while, anyway. What's the what, what's your calculation that it will be far off? The uh, legislation. I couldn't really guess because I'm not that familiar with the legislative, legislative procedures over here. But uh, I've had some people tell me that they did estimate 18 months. So what can be done to stop the pop pirates? One solution? Use force. The Dutch did 18 months ago. They seized a pirate radio and TV tower in a dawn swoop by police and navy by simply declaring it an island because it rested on the seabed. It was silenced in mid-pop. Another solution, sanctions. Scandinavian countries have already adopted this course to great effect against their pirate radios, penalizing advertisers and suppliers. It could be tried on the British pirates. The offshore tenders are the pirates' lifeline. For their daily rations, they rely on British firms who stock up the supply boats. On 242 meters in the medium wave band, this is Radio Scotland. Ironically, the pirates wouldn't get their fan mail without the cooperation of their arch enemy, the GPO. It's the GPO who complained that the pirates endanger shipping by cluttering up the radio waves and interfere with European radio reception. The pirates dismiss both charges. <laughs> After force and sanctions, a third choice is open to the Postmaster General, to give commercial radio legal status on shore. The only licensed commercial station in Britain so far is on the Isle of Man. Manx Radio offers some pop music like the Pirates, but fills another role as well in the local community life.
You're listening to Max Radio on 232 meters medium wave and 89 megacycles VHF. Interrupting just a moment or two to tell you that we have just had added into us some spectacles. Obviously, children's spectacles from the look of them, about 12 or 13 perhaps, and lost this morning outside the Villa Marina. What has happened here, obviously, is a child accompanying mother to the Manx Music Festival has dropped the spectacles and they've been mislaid. They look as though they're badly needed. The lenses are fairly thick and they've been stuck together on the left-hand frame with some uh, tape of some kind. So if these mean your spectacles, mother, would you get onto the phone Manx Radio? 3277, phone us up and we'll get them returned to you just as fast as possible. 20 minutes past 10 and back we go to the music. A firm believer in local commercial broadcasting is Manx Radio Chairman Richard Mayer. Well, first of all, the public like local stations. There are more people in the Isle of Man listening to Manx Radio than all the other stations they can hear combined. Secondly, we believe, and we've proved it, we think, that it stimulates the local economy tremendously. And thirdly, I think, and I'm sure we've proved, in fact, that public service is by no means inconsistent with commercial operation. We're giving public service of one sort and another the whole time. Do you think the government are intending to act now on the pirate? I think that if pirate stations were made illegal, and it was made illegal for advertisers to buy time, or anybody in Great Britain to sell time, this would cut off the lifeblood immediately and they wouldn't last very long. And the answer to that from the pirates is that they could get the advertising place from the continent or America? Well, you know, British advertisers are law-abiding people, just like anybody else in this country. And if the government made the thing illegal, there are very few of them in the long run, I think, who would go round the corner to do something which they know their own government considers illegal. I don't think this would happen, to a sufficient extent anyway, to keep the pirates in business. If it's as easy as that, why don't you think the government have acted? Well, it isn't for me to say why the government haven't acted. We only know they haven't. Any government action must affect the BBC. Greetings, Pop Pickers. It's Pick of the Pops. And the lineup today includes Norma Tanega, the Righteous Brothers, Roy C., Stevie Wonder, the Morgan James duo, and Gene Latter. Then comes the numbers and the poppers, Bob Dylan, Frank Sinatra, The Small Faces, Dionne Warwick, The Dave Clark Five, Silla Black, The Spencer Davis Group, and The Battle. And Dave D, Dozy, Dicky, Mick and Titch, The Beach Boys, Crispy and St. Peter's, Chair, The Love and Spoon Paul, Dusty Springfield, and Manfred Mann. the new chart climbers and for the first time ever at number 19 is America's Norma Taniga. Already the pirates have had their effect at the BBC. Shows like Pick of the Pops are the light programme's answer to the pirates. Some BBC DJs are frankly mid-Atlantic in style and go out to sell their shows now. But the BBC is still handicapped by the rules over needle time. BBC producers reckon that if they had unlimited needle time, the pirates would soon be off the air. The first man ever to broadcast on pirate radio, Simon D of Radio Caroline, is now a regular late night DJ with the BBC. Erica Rogers, who's the nurse's home, South It's a far Grimpy. cry from the days when BBC radio announcers read the news wearing formal black tie and dinner jacket. Loving, nothing more, but your sweet loving, stay around. Let's give it one more try. It's clear that the pirate radio has changed the tone of much of the BBC light music programmes. The manner is relaxed and chatty, and shows are, unlike the old days, unscripted. The same DJs often turn up to plug records on Radio Luxembourg. I'm 
I'm sorry, Erica Rogers. I said I didn't know what SRN stood for. And it stood for State Registered Nurse or something, doesn't it? My producer tells me. I thought it stood for Sorry Wrong Number or something. You probably found the BBC claim that their listening no, audience the hasn't been dented by the pop pirates, well. but they're obviously aware of the competition. Yeah, Director of Sound Broadcasting, Frank Gillard. If the Postmaster General cleared the pirates off the air tomorrow, what alternative programme could the BBC put on? The well, same sort of programme. Uh, I don't think the BBC could do much in the way of providing an alternative. Look what it's doing at the moment. The light program is offering 17 hours a day, and that's a deuce of a lot, of entertainment music of one kind and another. Uh, we certainly could not put on the sort of program the pirates are providing, because you can only do that if you have unlimited use of gramophone records. And we are limited, we are rationed in our use of gramophone records. We have, in fact, a ration of four and a half hours a day in a 21 and a half hour broadcasting day. And we will not get any more uh, needle time. Could local radio provide an answer to the pop pirates? I think not. Um, the BBC agrees with the Postmaster General, who says that the kind of service that the pirates are providing is a national service and should be nationally provided. There's nothing local about um, the jukebox, about the gramophone record. If you're going to have local radio, let it provide a service which is additional to everything that exists now. Let it serve local interests which don't get served in radio. And our argument is that if there is room in the whole spectrum of newspapers for the local newspaper, if the local newspaper does a good job, then the local radio station should also do a good local job. Do you think local radio could compete with the Pirates' 24-hour music programmes? Well, I'm sure of this. Uh, some people would prefer the music, some would prefer the talk. Uh, some would move between the two. Why not? This is, this is what they do between home light and third. You're adding an extra strand to broadcasting in this country and covering an interest that's not covered at present. Has there ever been any possibility of the BBC taking advertisements? No, there's never been any possibility of this. And we believe, in fact, that uh, public service radio and television should be provided on the licence fee system. The government may pronounce soon on the future of radio in Britain. Mr. Wedgwood Ben, the Postmaster General, has already pronounced on the pirates. They're stealing the copyright and paying no money for it. They're playing records that musicians have recorded and giving them no money for it. They're endangering the ship-to-shore radio, and there's a real risk that distress at sea might not be reported because of the inadequate fumbling handling of equipment. The pirates are a menace, and I don't believe at all that uh, the public wouldn't support action to enforce the law in the interests of all these people whom I've mentioned, quite aside from interference in other countries. Britain signed the European agreement to outlaw the pirates 15 months ago, but it's not yet been ratified. When can we expect action? I can't peer into a crystal ball, but I can say this, that um, this government, and I believe uh, any government, would enforce uh, existing law, uh, would uh, carry legislation through, and that the pirate radio ships have no future at all. I'm quite con convinced of that. And I think the sooner they're convinced of it, the better. In the Commons this afternoon, Mr. Ben repeated his threat. The pirates have not yet got the message.